In this recording, I'm assuming that you are already familiar with the gradient operator, often called GRAD, and sometimes called DEL. It's written as an upside-down capital Greek delta symbol, and it's a vector, so I've put a squiggle underneath to indicate that. GRAD is also an example of something known as a differential operator. That means that it contains derivatives which act on whatever follows them to the right. In two dimensions, we can write grad as d by dx, d by dy, using partial derivatives. We can also use i and j to express the vector nature of grad, but notice how I've been careful to put i and j to the left of the operators. We don't want them to the right, because d by dx acting on i would simply kill it off, i being a constant vector. Similarly for the j. There's a natural extension of grad to three dimensions, using z and the vector k, or indeed to any number of dimensions you like. But in this recording we will only use the two-dimensional version. Now what I actually want to do with the grad here is to show how it can be used to express the directional derivative on a surface in a very compact way. Before we had access to the grad operator you might have seen this done somewhat differently. Look at the next page. Maybe this diagram will ring some bells with you. Here I've drawn a frame of axes x, y and z with the usual orientation and I've shown a small piece of a surface z equals f of x, y sitting up somewhere in space. I've marked two points p on the surface p and q and I'm assuming that p and q are quite close to each other. I'm now going to drop some vertical lines down from P and Q to the XY plane and draw the projection of the path PQ in the XY plane. The projection is the red line. If P and Q are very close, then the red line is approximately straight. And of course, all that we do here will assume that we take limits in which Q and P merge. In that case, we're talking about the tangent to the surface at P and the projection down into the xy plane is the projection of the tangent. I'm now going to extend my red line back until it hits the x-axis and show the angle that it makes with the x-axis. We'll call it alpha. By drawing some triangles, right angle triangles, with the red line as the hypotenuse, we can argue that the directional derivative for the surface at the point P has the following form. It's often called m alpha, and it's a combination of the partial derivatives dz by dx and dz by dy, with coefficients cos alpha and sin alpha. I hope you've seen this formula before. My task now is going to be to rewrite m alpha using two slightly different approaches. I'm going to use the gradient operator, and I'm also going to get rid of the angle alpha, and instead write the direction in terms of a vector. In fact, the red line could be thought of as representing a vector. Let's mark it on now. Let's call it the vector E. The vector E represents the direction from P to Q as Q and P merge and we get a tangent to the plane. E is parallel to the tangent at P in the appropriate direction. Next, I'm going to focus on what's happening in the XY plane. I don't need the third dimension for this. Remember, E makes the angle alpha with the positive x-axis. I've also marked on the angle that I've called beta, the angle that E makes with the positive y-axis. And of course we can see from the diagram that it's 90 degrees minus alpha. Now E is a vector, so it has components. Let's call them E1 and E2, and write it using I and J. I've also rather suggestively included a right angle triangle in this picture, with the angle alpha in. The sides of that triangle will have ratios given by the components of E. In the x direction E1, in the y direction E2, and the sloping red side, the hypotenuse, the length of E. Let's mark those on. We're now in a position to write trig ratios for alpha in terms of the components of E. Clearly cos alpha 
so the adjacent over the hypotenuse, so it's E1 over the length of E. Sine alpha, of course, is the opposite of the hypotenuse, so that's E2 over the length of E. But now let's remember that angle beta. Beta is 90 minus alpha, so we could mark it in our triangle here. It's clear that sine alpha is the same as cos beta. Now we could write everything in terms of cosines. In fact, alpha and beta are the angles for the direction cosines of the vector E. Alpha is the direction cosine, sorry, cos alpha is the direction cosine of the angle E makes with the x-axis. Similarly, cos beta is the direction cosine of the angle that E makes with the y-axis. They're the things that elsewhere are sometimes called L and M. And as we've already seen in the triangle, we have expressions for those things. Cos alpha is E1 over the length of E, and cos beta, which remember was the same as sine alpha, was E2 over the length of E. So far, so good. Now let's go down to our directional derivative again. M alpha, remember, was cos alpha times dz dx plus sine alpha dz dy. But sine alpha is the same as cos beta, and both of those coses could be written in terms of e. First of all, e1 over the length of e for the cos alpha dz by dx. Sorry, that should be an x. Let's get that right. And then the sine alpha, which was the same as cos beta, and that could be written as e2 over the length of e, and now dz dy. Now, does that remind you of something? It could be a dot product, couldn't it? Suppose we took out the factor of 1 over the length, And then we could write that as e1 d by dx acting on z plus e2 d by dy acting on z. Written that way, and remembering our definition of grad, this is exactly 1 over the length of e times the dot product e dot grad, acting on z. But here we're now seeing e divided by its own length, so that's just the unit vector in the direction e. So finally, we have the dot product of the unit vector in the direction we're interested in, dotted with the gradient of z. That's another expression for the directional derivative. Elsewhere, we will show how to calculate such a thing for a given surface at a given point.